Today we're having a look at this IBM System P5 550Q sporting two quad-core Power 5 Plus processors. Aside from the stunning good looks, these Power Series machines are fascinating for a few reasons. First, the FAA, or Federal Aviation Administration here in the US, used them for many years as air traffic control machines running various software for that. You can look up FAA budget proposals and justifications, and they actively mention the need to decommission these P5 series of AIX, or IBM's Unix variant machines, for x86 machines running Linux. They also have capabilities that trace their roots back to mainframes. One being the HMC, or Hardware Management Console, a commodity piece of equipment that you can use to manage many of these P5 machines. Another being the concept of LPARs, or Logical Partitions. Basically a VM that's a little lower level and lets you divide these things up at the hardware level and run very independent workloads on them. So in this video, we're going to get to know this 550Q a little better, see if we can't get it powered up. We'll learn a little bit about some power requirements you should take into consideration if you're buying one of these big guys. And then hopefully we'll be able to get it hooked up to a physical HMC I've got and manage it. Let's get into it. It was no small feat to get this thing up on the bench. In fact, in its previous location, I had it on blocks. This is the closest I'm going to get to being a car guy. It was so I could like get my hands under it and lift it up again. This thing is so heavy. And in fact, on the top, it's got the 70 to 121 pound warning sticker, 32 to 55 kilograms. It's got to be really close to that. It doesn't have any hard drives, but that's got to add maybe 20 pounds at the most. It's probably about hundred pounds to that end. First thing we're going to do is take off this half rail kit. By that, I mean, I only have half the rails. They either threw away or left the other side in the rack when they took it out and it's all banged up and that's getting sharp. So I'm just going to hurt myself. So we'll take these out. It is surprisingly common to see flathead screws in an enterprise rail system, though I know you could just use the nut driver. It's like working on a house from the fifties. That was easy. Nice solid metal. These are pretty standard screws. I, I didn't measure them or anything, but I know I could probably find more of those. Sun like to use like really weird, fine pitch thread screws. Super hard to find, but these look pretty common. Someday I'd like to rack up all this big equipment I have, and I can't do anything with these rails now because I only have half the rails. And of course I don't have anywhere to put it anyway. So what I do is I label it with something I'll understand at least, big IBM P5. This is the bigger one of the two I've got. Got the screws right here all taped up, and then we put it in the rail graveyard. Nearly every enterprise machine you pick up is going to have half the rails. So right in there is the other P5's rail system, half of them. That's half of a V240, Sun V240. Bunch of Sun stuff in here. I think that's some compact stuff. Anyway, I keep it all in there. Someday we'll complete the set. Let's have a walk around this thing. But to aid us in appreciation of just what this thing is up to, let's pull out the other P5 I've got. This is an IBM P5 520, which I got in a Craigslist deal spring of 2023. And to be honest with you, when I bought this one, I thought I was getting the same thing physically. So this one is much more equipped, way more processors, way more RAM. But what I didn't know, it feels like it's twice the size. It's just an absolute monster. They're pretty much the same story from the front. This is that little guy on the top here. And in fact, I bet their faceplates are interchangeable. Let's find out. Note about these things. You can't take the faceplates off unless you've got somewhere to lean off a table. Otherwise you'll probably break them. See what I mean? 85 pounds max on the little guy. 121.2 pounds max on the big one. I remember thinking this was the biggest machine I was ever going to own. Face plates are pretty nice. Got these blue tabs and they slide out of these slots. <laughs> the moment you've been waiting for the larger ones face plate on the smaller one. What a surprise. While we've got the face plate off, something that happens to these poor old heavy boys is some weight gets pushed on the corner here and the rail mechanism just gets like totally bent out of whack. So there's a straightened one on the little guy. And this one isn't too bad, but this one, this one over here is clearly having trouble and good old IBM. You can kind of just manhandle it and fix it right up. 
And there we go. That looks a lot better. I think you'll agree. Not perfect, but not racking it up anyway. We'll start on the front here, slightly different identifiers. We've got a type 913152A on the 520 here and a type 913355A on the big guy. And that corresponds to this being what's called a system P5 550 or a 550Q, the Q standing for quad core. I'm under the impression that that's what I have here. At least that's what I think I paid for. We'll find out when we get it fired up. But I find it odd that IBM doesn't say 550 anywhere on this one. This one's a 520, no 520 on there. But it's my understanding that, you know, if you and I were having a conversation about this, we would be calling it a 550 or a 550Q. It doesn't say that anywhere on the front. A Sun machine is gonna say, you know, it's a Sun V240. An HP is gonna say it's a ProLiant, you know, DL580. It'll even tell you what generation it is sometimes. P5 machines, you just get that it's a P5 and then you get this type identifier that I don't think you would ever actually use in practice. The only way to know what this means, at least either know it already or look it up in the manual. Just sort of something interesting about these particular machines. Everything else is the same, except this one just says DVD-ROM and this one is a DVD multi CD RW probably slightly newer, I guess, or maybe the original buyer paid more money to get that. And then this is very common in eBay listings. You'll see these blue nubs. And I've always wondered like, what's the story with that? Because the ones I have just slide right out. It's like completely fine. This is my only experience I've had with these. These are actual drives in here. We'll look at that in a minute. But as it turns out, these just, <laughs> These can just break off. It's easy for these to just pull out of their clip. And I think the reason is so that you could change it between a blank and an actual drive. But these ones are like super good, not a problem. And these ones just fall, just fall apart. <laughs> what ends up happening is you have this blank drive without the clip on it and anything in the computing industry that has a little item like this that can just come off, gonna be lost. On this thing, you can see there's two grooves there and a little slip notch there, and basically hooks in and then clips. And I suppose, I don't know, certain iterations or maybe these have been pulled out a bunch of times, they get looser and just come right out. I believe the reason this little clip comes out in the first place is so that you can reuse this piece right here in a real drive. So this is an actual drive tray with metal and this special adapter board on the back, which is a huge pain in the ass. We'll get to that later. The drive boards have their own locking mechanism into this faceplate right here. And so it is my assumption, this little blue knob, you can just undo it. And sure enough, it comes off. So this is the blanking plate, which you, you could theoretically keep a lot of stuff in. And here's the little pole for the blanking plate that comes off so that you can get access to this thing. Yeah, it was just so they could use this plastic piece with the clips and put it on an actual drive sled. On the side here, of course, you can see the new one is much longer. It does come with handles, just like the other one. I haven't trusted these very much. I suppose for these, I wouldn't trust picking up the whole unit with two of them even. I think it's for two people one on each side to get it into the rack, you know? Continuing on, let's have a look at the back of this thing. Where I find it interesting, I'll compare and contrast to this other one. Here we've got dual power supplies, serial port. These actually interact with the remote management capabilities of this machine. They're not just serial ports that the OS uses. Speaking of remote management, you see we've got these HMC links. This area right here is very different from the smaller one. So the smaller one has a removable board called an FSP or flexible service processor with these four ports on it. This one appears to be built into the main board of the machine. That'll be really interesting once we get inside. I think the main board is the planar in IBM parlance, not a main board. Over here, a couple of USB ports, some 10, 100, one gig NICs built into the planar, some sort of expansion slots. Maybe I'll have to look those up in the manual. This is a USB connector for a rack indicator. Maybe either a IBM proprietary rack has plugs for these or some sort of light, long story short, plugs into this so that you can remotely turn that light on and identify which machine you're dealing with. An Intel 10100 one gig NIC, a SCSI controller, 
you'll find that these P5 machines come with what feels like redundant PCI peripherals. We've got two NICs over there, why do we need two more? Well, when you divide these things up into multiple units with LPARs, logical partitions, you need to assign physical items to each LPAR. So here we could have two LPARs, each with their own NIC. It's my hunch that's why you get a lot of extra network interfaces in these things, because they were trying to put the LPARs each on their own NIC. And so our setup here could support one, two, three, four dedicated NICs on four LPARs. You could be running some sort of co-located service where you give one customer an LPAR, or maybe you've got a test deployment and a prod deployment or a dev and test or something. You wanna keep them totally isolated. I think it's more than just having a management network because you've got the HMC for that. At this point, some of you are probably thinking, HMC, LPAR, AIX, what is this guy talking about? I touched on all that a little bit in the beginning, but we'll do a quick refresher. We'll start with HMC or Hardware Management Console. An HMC is terminology that traces its roots back to mainframes. You would have a commodity or lower powered machine hooked up to the mainframes to remotely manage them, to view things like logs, power them up, power them down, things like that. And that approach has lived on in the power series of machines. So this is an IBM X series X86 one U rack server from 04. It has been deemed by the IBM gods as allowed to run the HMC software. So HMC is just a stripped down version of Linux that runs some software that knows how to connect this guy up with a bunch of these power machines and remotely manage them. I think what's going on is the HMC versions look for special hardware and types that IBM has deemed as HMC compatible. For example, we've got this e-server type 7310-CR3. This is one of many X series x86 machines that are allowed to run HMC software. For a long time, the preferred approach is to deploy the HMC software into a virtual machine. So there's definitely no need to actually have this physical unit here, but I think you'll agree that it is much more fun. Now, with the help of the HMC in remote management, we can create something called LPARs or logical partitions. We can divide these larger servers up into pieces and share hardware across multiple OS installs. You can think of this like a VM, but it's a little lower level. It's a little closer to the hardware. So theoretically, at least according to IBM marketing, you'll get a little better performance and you'll definitely have stricter hardware separation between the units as opposed to VMs sharing things. LPAR came from, you guessed it, mainframes. One of the very fun things about this P series of machines is all this mainframe influence they had and you can see it alive and well and get to interact with it. The hypervisor that runs on this and LPARs are a fundamental part of how the system works. What's called the power hypervisor always runs at the firmware level on these things. So with, I could take away this HMC, I could just install a copy of AIX, IBM's Unix variant on this thing, and it would technically be running in one LPAR, I think. And by the way, generally speaking, hypervisor is just a fancy word for software or firmware that lets you run multiple OS instances on one computer. With all that out of the way, let's keep looking at this thing. And finally, this funny looking connector is one of the reasons I was drawn to this machine. This is an HSL card or high speed link. It's proprietary IBM stuff. It's got a few names. It's also known as remote IO or RIO. And my understanding is that it's a high speed connection for two or more servers. The reason I even recognized it is because I have a couple of these special cables that came in the lot with this original P5 I picked up. All the stuff was in a storage unit. I found it on Craigslist. And this means there was probably more HSL gear and I just didn't notice or didn't know what it was at the time. I think I thought this was a SCSI cable at the time. Which means I've got a couple of these cables I can plug in here, but nothing to plug the other end into. So we'll have to explore that in the future. I don't even quite understand what you'd use this for. So let me know if you've used it before. These cables are super heavy duty, by the way. Nice pull tabs to unlock them and stuff. Up top, the typical information you might expect on the top of an enterprise server. System board layout, things like that. Some nice thumb screws on the back for theoretically toolless entry. Comes off nice and easy. And then we've got an impressive array of modular components. Looks like four very large fans. They of course come out. The orange color means these can be pulled while the machine is running. Blue means the machine needs to be off. That's pretty standard across these enterprise machines. The fans are no joke, so it'll be interesting to see how loud those are. Two redundant very long power supplies take up almost the length of the whole case they are pretty impressive this is a power supply from that smaller 520 it's impressive in its own right but pretty much nothing compared to these ones let's get this other one out here we can start to see a little bit more of the machine it's got this nice protective plastic to prevent any sort of shorting between components it's like the board is made in japan there's some sort of connector here along with a couple pin headers. 
The power supplies do not have anything that slots into those. So yeah, those other three headers are for something else. What I'm hoping is the star of the show. These are the CPU and RAM modules. What I want to see in here is two quad core Power 5 Pluses. Oof. Very heavy. <laughs> Heat sink, very heavy. Passive cooler, that's what these large fans are always blowing air across. Really, really large proprietary connector, of course. Got some RAM right here. Let's see what these are all about. I want to say this thing has 32 gigs of DDR2 RAM. DDR2 DIM RAM. It's got some OEM, IBM FRU branding, field replaceable unit numbers, four gig PC2 4200. So yeah, eight slots each, assuming this one is equally endowed. That's actually 64 gigs of RAM, a little more than I remembered from the eBay listing. These CPU module boards, apparently made by Hitachi. Let's see what's going on in the second one. Presumably the same thing. Yeah, four gig sticks. So 64 gigs of RAM and I've got at least two processors. So far so good. Let's see if I can take this out for you. There we go. We'll wipe that off too. Pulling that protective plastic piece back a little bit. This is that HMC area I was talking about, which is removable on the other machine. So must be built into the main board. That's really interesting. These are the VRMs, voltage regulator modules, I think. And you would need one for each CPU. They slide out nice and easy. Got a cap with a sticker on it and the rest don't. That's interesting. What's really scary about this stuff is right now, I'm gonna eat my words saying this, you can kind of buy this stuff and it's just just gonna work, you know? It's pushing 20-ish 20, 20 years old, but that's not too bad. But pretty soon, buying this stuff is gonna be like buying a computer from the 80s. You're gonna have to recap all these and everything. <laughs> Those will be dark times. Speaking of capacitors, is that what these are? At any rate, these are those very large connectors for the CPU boards. It's not just these bigger pins you can see. There's smaller sort of IDE sized pins in between each row. Get you down in there. Look at all those pins. Incredible. Moving back, this is a SCSI controller. Pretty common, or I should say I'm two for two anyway. The other one's just like this. You have this SCSI cable bundle going to the back plane of the drives here and it just goes to a card that's in one of the PCI slots nothing built into the main board and our HSL card which is huge another very large connector a computer in its own right in there I'm sure this is cool there's some indicator lights right there and you can clearly see some nice curved light tubing to get an LED on the board to shine out the back there two of them Gotta love that. There's that connector back in there. It's something about that. You just look at that and you know IBM's involved. And they plug into what I think are just normal PCIX slots. So presumably I could just put some normal PCIX cards in there. You probably noticed before, had this really nice bracket that the cable slides through to keep it secure and protected. Screws in on the back there, kind of cool. And I think this little guy lets me put another one of these in because it extends the height of the bracket beyond normal PCI. And of course, I've got two connectors back in there. Interesting. Pointing towards the front of the case, more big caps and a CR2450 battery, which I definitely do not have. What's hopefully the final look inside? Took out that other protector plate here so you can get the whole experience. Beautiful machine. No, very little space wasted. I'll say that. Anecdotally, it feels a little more well thought out than that 520 I've got, a little more polished. These 550s started coming out in 2005, but it looks like this one was built in May of 2007. Oh, and it goes without saying, I'm utterly satisfied with the lack of dirt in this machine. This is, this is it, just these divider plates have a little dust on them. No big deal at all. That is the only dirt on this whole machine. Incredible. Also very nice attention to detail. Tells you which end goes towards the front and which end goes towards the rear. And this one is uh, light tubed out. Look at that. And my first concern, processor one here fits flush, no problem. Processor two, you can see that. And this doesn't want to close. I, I inspected the pins a lot. I'm going to do it again. Maybe, maybe this is just bent up. Maybe it's fine, but 
it definitely does not want to seat in there as cleanly as this one does. Another detail, there's a little lip on this plastic divider and the CPU cage kind of comes down on it so that these act as one for probably for airflow reasons. That's pretty cool. These CPU modules weigh nearly seven pounds, by the way, or 3,100 grams. All back together, I can't figure out what's going on with this thing not being as tight as the other one. And this, this thing's obviously messed up. It's almost like something is stopping it from seating the rest of the way down. Not that the pins are gnarled or anything and they look fine. So I suppose we will find out. I guess I'll leave the lid off so that I can watch these. Maybe they'll tell us something interesting. Hopefully we don't see this alarm one go off. Let's get our hard drive situation squared away. This 550 came with several of these blanking trays, which you've seen before. My 520, the smaller machine, came with a couple of these full hard drive caddy trays, but that's not enough. These P5 machines need a special backplane adapter plate. This thing accepts Ultra 320 SCSI drives, but as you can see, that is not a normal SCSI connector. I only have two of these adapter plates because they're like $25 each. It's kind of ridiculous. You do get a drive though. I've never gotten this drive to work. I have two sets of these. In my other P5, I could never get these recognized. I think I just need to low level format it or something, but I don't care about that right now. I'm gonna get this thing out of the tray and in its place, we will throw this Maxter, which I apparently tested in June of 2023 on a sun machine, probe SCSI command. This is a Maxter Atlas 10,000 RPM, 146 gig ultra 320 SCSI from 2005. Better look at that adapter plate. When you buy them, usually they come with the back metal tray and you've got some light tubing to some LEDs coming off the back plane, I think. Get these screws off. Imagine doing this all day in a brand new data center in 2006. So you'll see the absurdity of this. This is a normal Ultra 320 SCSI drive. This is a purely mechanical conversion from one physical connector to another. I'd love to know the reasoning behind that. I know I'm sounding salty about it. Well, that's because I am. I hope there's a good reason that I can't just put as many drives in here as I'd like without buying these $25 adapter plates on eBay. If you are following along at home, when you're taking drives out of these things, don't just go try to yank it out. It's got these plastic clips and this actually pulls away like that so that you can actually safely take the drive out. Don't just go yanking on it, you'll make a mess. Okay, I'm done complaining about these. What I do like is they're very solid and they use this lever to push them into their slot. So you go like this and then you pull down on this and it latches and pushes everything in. You don't use any extra force. You rely entirely on the mechanism to push itself into place and lock down. Super nice. We are very close to firing this up and seeing if it works. Let's do a little theory of operation here. This system console is one of the most iconic pieces of this system P5 line, I think. It's able to spit out a bunch of progress codes about how far it is into the boot process and you can look up each one and see what they mean. These progress codes are a sort of a mainframe notion that IBM had and other manufacturers. I find these P-series machines very fascinating because they have a little bit of that mainframe you know, feel to them. Fun fact, this should be a serial console cable of some sort. I've never been able to get it to work on my other P5. Maybe we'll try it again on this one. We'll begin by getting a serial to USB adapter hooked up to serial port one here. And that should give us serial console access and we'll be able to administer this machine. It also should be hosting something called the ASMI, Advanced System Management Interface, over this HMC connection. That console on the front should be able to tell us what IP it's hosting it on, and that'll be a web interface we can use to administer this machine. It's very likely a password has been set on this machine and we won't actually be able to get in and do much. That was an easy problem to solve on the other P5 because this FSP board just comes right out and then you go ahead and toggle the world's tiniest dip switches and that ends up resetting the password. I don't know what the procedure is for this 550. Presumably somewhere on this board, there's some jumpers we can flip. I saw one when I pulled back that plastic sheeting under the power supplies. If the password's set, I'll need to look up and see what we need to do about that. And if we get that far, we'll fire up this IBM eServer 7310-CR3. This is just a one use server. A few of the model types IBM deemed as physical HMCs, the hardware management console, 
In a previous video, I got the HMC image running on this guy, fully functional. My other P5 can connect to it and be remotely managed. What we'll do is get this one with its HMC connector on the same network as this guy, and we should be able to remotely administer this thing, create LPARs, cluster the machines someday. I'm really excited to have two P5s running and administered by one physical HMC. I've got a serial to USB converter going into serial port one. I never got this serial to USB to work on my other P5, so hopefully we have better luck today. Otherwise, I'll use a real serial cable and plug it into a different machine. The first network port on the HMC is plugged into this special network port here that goes direct through to an XPVM. So hopefully if we can't get over the serial console, we'll be able to see the web interface. And then of course we have power. I don't think these things like to roar to life right away. I think they do a bunch of boot checks and everything before you actually power it on. But every time I say that about a machine, it does the exact opposite. So we'll see. That's good. Yeah, it's not roaring to life right away. It's gonna spit out a bunch of codes on the screen there about the progress it's making along its way. I'm gonna let this warm up for a minute and then we'll go check the serial console. This is really interesting. So you can see on the panel, it says HMC equals zero. What this means is this machine used to be managed by an HMC and it can't find its HMC. So I'm still gonna try to get in the serial console and the remote management real quick, but we're probably gonna have to reset something so that we can connect it to my HMC. That ethernet jack I plugged the HMC into flows through to a dedicated NIC on a server in my rack running Proxmox. So I can run this tool called NetDiscover on that NIC. And pretty much right away, it finds that it's got 192.168.3.147 connected. So that's the HMC address. I think that's just the default address. So it's real leet hacking going on down here. That NIC is ultimately passed through to a Windows XP machine on my Proxmox instance. And I can set that NIC to that network. And we should be able to load up the ASMI in the web browser. Okay, for some reason, it took like 10, 20 minutes for this thing to be able to ping 192.168.3.147, the service processor, but it can now. And if I try to hit that in a browser, we get the dreaded SSL error, no cipher overlap. Firefox 3.03 from 2008 is too new to load this. I got around this last time by loading it up in a Windows ME VM, but I don't have an easy way to get that Windows ME VM on this network, so let me have a think about this. I think you know what I'm about to go do. Getting closer. Invalid security certificate. 100% approved. Ah. An ASMI. Yes, we're in. Sorta. If this thing was connected to an HMC, I'm going to have a hard time believing it's using the default admin username and admin password, but You'll see. No, definitely not. Invalid username or password. Okay, now I gotta figure out how to reset that. Put the service processors up. Good first steps. Somewhere in here must be a pair of dip switches just like the other one, but it's gotta be on the main board somewhere. So I'm gonna get digging and hopefully I can find them. I'm pretty sure down in here is the service processor logic because that big IBM chip is the same exact one that's on the removable FSP from the smaller P5. So there's just gotta be a pair of these floating around somewhere. I can't find it yet. I really hope there's a way to do it because I can't find anything online about resetting this particular machine. Okay, I finally found confirmation in some HMC documentation that it is indeed this one jumper I was able to find way back earlier in the video under Power Supply 2. I was really suspicious because every FSP I've ever seen even on the main board, had two dip switches. And this one has a protective cover over it that I'm gonna have to peel off to flip. But anyway, confirmed, model 550, that's the one. I'm gonna flip that and hopefully we can get in. The docs are hilarious, by the way. It says, oh yeah, just pull out this second power supply. You have to peel off this protective tape on it. There's this thing protecting the entire board on here that you, there's just no way you'd get your hand in there to do that. I don't know if all units shipped with this stuff or with this, but yeah, funny, usually the IBM docs are spot on and this one was a, a little off. Round two. Great news, it has reset something. So the first port is default 192.168.2. The second one is 192.168.3. I actually had it plugged into the second one before, I forgot to tell you. So before, if you remember, we were only finding dot three and that's what I was connecting to. So it definitely reset that first one. Also, 
I only have one cable plugged into the back right now. How does this tool find both of these? What's the IBM doing? Networking. I haven't been able to get anything out of the serial port this whole time. And I think it's just the cabling setup. I had the same problem on my other P5 when I looked at it. And ultimately I had to hook a real serial cable up between the P5 and a little lab machine I've got over here. And then to screen record it, I SSH'd in and stuff. And it would get messed up all the time. I'd have to physically restart the Linux machine to be able to talk to the P5 again. It's really particular about its serial settings and things would get messed up all the time. So we're just not even going to deal with it right now. But the ASMI is back up. It's theoretically been reset. So I should be able to say admin, admin. I think we're in. Yeah. Oh, yes, we are in. What's it going to do? I think it's going to make me change the password right away. That's fine. There's a general user and an admin user on these things. Usually you give the general user or maybe it just has by default less permissions. And then this thing still thinks it knows about an HMC. We'll deal with that. Get this reset. And on the left, you can see we have full access now. Ooh, yeah. The real-time progress indicator is a fan favorite. It is a web recreation of the green screen on the front of the machine. <laughs> if that's not remote management, I don't know what is. Vital product data might be useful to us. Great news, looking up the processor FRU number 10N8123. These are indeed quad-core processors, so we have what's called an eight-way machine, eight cores. This is great. Well, in the hardware management console section, it doesn't know about anything. So what we're going to do is give this an IP on my actual normal network. We'll hook all our stuff up and see if we can get this thing on an HMC. Over in the network configurations for the first service processor interface, we're going to set it to dot one dot one five six. The HMC is one five four. The other P five is one five five. This one's one five six. And then we'll leave the other one as the IBM default as a glimmer of hope for the next guy. We're going to try that again because you have to select configure this interface. Now I'm guessing this is going to kick us out. Didn't work again. I wonder if I'll need to do it over the serial console. Yeah, it doesn't want to persist those settings. I tried it on the other interface as well. I guess I'll restart the machine. Rebooted. Let me take you on a little IBM adventure here. My screen is damaged, so I can only actually see these letters at very particular angles. That's why the camera's so far away. On my other one, I could just film it straight on. So yeah, that's kind of a bummer. The screen, of course, gives you a bunch of information. We've already looked at HMC equals zero, means it's, it knew about an HMC once upon a time. This N right here means it's in normal mode. I think it stands for normal. So you go to two, go in there, over again. Now that's M instead of N, that stands for manual. And you just keep going until you're out. And now the panel is fully unlocked and you can do things like shut it down really fast and and get yourself in trouble. So we can go to an option called 30 now. Go over, let's look at zero. That's the first service processor interface. And it's still set to 192.168.2.147. Even though I reset it in the UI, I was wondering if a restart would fix it. And then of course we can go to the other one. Oh, that worked. What the heck? <laughs> That's not what I set it to. Uh, okay. So there's hope, 192.168.19, that'll, that'll work, that's okay. I wonder why it chose that. That's a reserved IP from my router. It should not be handing those out, and that's definitely not what I typed in. Let's look back at number one. Yeah, so the top interface is still on that dot .2 subnet. The second interface is on my dot .1 subnet where I want it. That's weird. Works for me. We've got them both plugged in. This is going to that XPVM. This is just going straight on the regular network. So let's see if we can go see 192.168.1.9. Yeah, someone's home. Networking. Speaking of wizard networking, this thing has two network interfaces, of course. One of them is on my regular network, the dot one subnet. And this is the one I change all the time to go look at items like this and change the subnet. So theoretically, we should be able to hit 1.9 and see our ASMI interface. This is good. It sees it. Just doesn't like this IBM eServer.ibm.com certificate. So we'll add the exception just like we did 
for the other IPs. Here we are. It's not the IP I wanted, but I'll take it. Let's see if we can still get in. Don't see why we wouldn't be able to. I just have to remember to make sure I always plug this thing in with the second port. Gets it on the network. Yeah, we're in, so let's get an HMC set up. Smelling a lot like LPARs down here. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. See how loud this thing is. <laughs> Anticlimactic for now. That's fully green. It's running through its codes. There's no OS or anything on here, but you can see it's running through its progress codes. We'll see where we get. Basically what's going to happen is I'm going to forget I did this and five minutes later, this thing's going to rip up. I wish I could show you what it's actually doing, but it's just too hard to film that damaged screen. So we use the next best thing. We're at 1100 2613. And if we consult the manual on reference codes, we've got a hundred volt check fault which might just mean it doesn't like that only one PSU is plugged in. Seeing a lot of stuff online about this thing wanting 220 volts <laughs> to start up. I don't have that to give it. After doing a little more research online, it sounds like these 550s with the quad core processors want 220 volts. I'm in North America, so I don't have 220 volts to give it easily. Anyway, it is possible though. Long story short, sounds like it wants both PSUs running, which kind of defeats the redundancy, but whatever. As long as I can get it running, I don't care. I've got this one going to another outlet on a different breaker, just out of an abundance of caution. And then the other PSU is here. Let's flip him on. A little more noise, but that's okay. Now let's try to start it up. We'll click this. Won't do anything immediately, but I see the progress codes progressing. Hopefully we get past our 110 volt alert. Same problem. So I'm booting it up from the UI here just to see if that makes a difference instead of the button on the front. It's not looking good. The very little information I can find online associated with this progress code and 550s is that you need more than 110 volts, which I don't have at the moment. We could get it, but I don't have it. So let's pull one of the processor cards out. I believe both power supplies are healthy, by the way. That being said, they'll both happily take 200 to 240 volts. So maybe that's the issue. I'm fairly certain this won't make a difference at all because you need another part, a processor filler card to take the place of one of these guys. And I don't have one. I'm obviously pulling that second one out because it didn't seat properly ever anyway. So, you know, who knows? And now it's complaining about 1100, 1511, which means power supply failure, which I don't think is true. I think they're both fine. Looking like we need more volts, but let's hook it up to an HMC anyway. I had a feeling this day would come when I don't have enough power to run a machine I bought, even though the machine is probably fine. We'll get this other module in and then hook it up to an HMC, see what happens. Well, I did approximately 10 seconds of research and we can see for this 550Q, it wants 200 to 240 volts AC for one to eight core and three to eight core, which is obviously what I'm trying to do here. And then clearly stated, important. If two processor cards are installed, the AC input must be 200 to 240 volt AC single phase. It does claim it can run a Power 5 Plus 4-core processor card, which is the cards I have, on 110, but I think you'll need that special placeholder card to go in the second slot. I have bought a computer. I cannot actually boot up at the moment. That's okay, though. I have a sub-panel in the room that I have a rack in. It should be relatively straightforward to add a circuit breaker there for 240 volts. I've never done that before, but... I think I could do it. And I kind of thought it would be inevitable. Anyway, I want to run some 20 amp lines for the rack anyway. It's not going to happen in this video, but I have an excuse to do it now. The way I've typically been looking out for higher power machines is the plug style, you know, something a little beefier like this kind of tips you off. But as it turns out, there are indeed these IEC style cables with a NEMA plug on the end that is rated for 240 volts. So I'll have to pick up some of those. So yeah, seeing this does not guarantee that it's going to want only 110 volts. The good news is I have a sub panel here right by the rack anyway, 
that I can add a breaker to. And the whole rack is actually running off this one 15 amp circuit. I've been wanting to pull this out and replace it with 20 amp outlets anyway. So this is a really good excuse. And even though all you Europeans make fun of us, I can definitely get 240 volts out of this thing no problem. I'll just have to put the right breaker in and wire up the right receptacle, a NEMA 620 or 630 or something like that. That'll be in a future video. Probably won't actually film it because it's kind of dangerous, but rest assured, I'm gonna do it exactly the way you would have. And we'll definitely be pulling permits and passing it by the local inspector here. But moving on, I'm gonna put that HMC machine in here on top of the rack because it's super loud. We are going to move this V240 out of its place of prominence because the next time I use it, I'm gonna rack it up. I finally bought a full kit. Brian, if you're watching, thanks for the tip about this rail kit on eBay. Got that physical HMC powered up. The 550's got power here on the bench. Of course, that's just for the service processor. We can't power it up. It takes about five, 10 minutes for that HMC machine to start up and you get access to the UI. I'm sort of remembering that it's pretty hard to use the UI on a browser because the pop-ups and Java and all that good 2005 stuff. So we'll hook up a monitor if we have to. When I'm using the HMC, I like to play a game called don't read any documentation and see if you can figure it out. So that's what we're gonna do. Over here in servers, this is the smaller P5. It's not powered on obviously, but it remembers it. And I think, here we go, yeah. So connections, add managed system. We can do it by IP address or it can find one. So let's see if it can find one. Let's make it search, I don't know, eight through 10 just for fun. Oh, it found it. This, this stuff is so fascinating. So cool. So I believe this is just that admin password we just reset. Let's select it, confirm add systems. Maybe a lengthy process, minutes to hours. Okay. I think it was like instant last time. It's sitting there, pending authentication. That's what you want to see. I think it's going to make us change the password right away. The managed system is waiting for the service processor password to be authenticated. I only read documentation when it puts it in front of me. I'm not breaking my rule here. So when we click on the machine, there's this update password task. I think that's all we want to do. Makes you change the password, basically, when you add it to a new HMC. Just like that. It knows about it. It knows it's powered off. I am pretty sure these are existing LPARs on this machine. Yeah, we've got this default partition profile, JDEDB. They all start with JDE. So this is where you can actually sort of configure the properties of partition. You can see you can give it minimum amount of memory and then a maximum. You can give it processors. Yeah, this is what we're gonna do once we can get this thing fired up after I do some electrical work in my home. Well, I sort of succeeded. I think we have a pretty solvable problem here with the power issue. I just need to do a little electrical work, but we got it on the HMC. I'm pretty sure it's gonna function just fine once we sort out our voltage issue. And we're just getting started with this IBM P-Series stuff. Up here, we've got a DS4000 fiber channel storage array. Fiber channel drives also have a special connector, in case you're wondering. This 520 actually came with a ton of fiber channel cards in the back, so I'm sure it will be excited to be reunited with one of its friends. But before we get there, I'd like to have both of these running. I believe there's some sort of clustering capability that I'd like to explore, along with, of course, creating a real LPAR. Haven't done that yet. I hope you enjoyed this walk through the P-Series machines anyway. I always have a really good time playing with these things. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing. It means a lot to me and helps the channel grow. And if you'd really like to support the channel, I'm also on Patreon where I do behind the scenes type videos of unboxing this stuff as I get it and giving it a first glance. I'm also going to be at VCF SoCal this Saturday, February 17th, 2024. So if you happen to see me there, definitely say hello. Thanks a lot for watching and I hope I see you in the next one.